reading through verse 18. John 3, 14 through 18. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hallelujah. That's John chapter 3, verses 14 through 80. And then I just want to read to you one verse from John chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus says in John 12, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. If you'll bow your heads with me one moment, and I'm sorry, I keep forgetting, Johnny, to forward it so you can read the passage as I read it. So as I pray, you can read it. <laughs> Father, once again, God, we come before you, grateful for your presence in this place. We sang the wonderful old song, The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows, and no truer words have ever been penned. God, you've been there for me so many times in my life. You've been a rescuer when I needed rescuing. You preserved my life, God, when it was on the edge of destruction. You've been my healer when I've been sick and nearly dead. And Lord, most of all, you've been my Savior when I was lost in sin without hope, separated from the living God. And Master, you came at a dark hour and did what no man could do so that I and those who will believe could be saved. And we're so grateful today, God, for salvation. Master, let the word of God go forth in power. Let it go forth with divine authority this hour. Anoint your speaker. Let me today, O oh God, be your mouthpiece. Let the word of God go forth. The last thing in the world we need in the church today is more thoughts of men, more man-made contrived doctrine, and more man-made thoughts. But rather today, God, use me. Let the word of God go forth from these lips that they might bring construction and not destruction, that they might bring health and healing, not sickness and sorrow. Master, that they might bring salvation and not condemnation. Oh God, use us today. Touch the ear of every single hearer, those of us in this place, those who are watching and will watch by reason of the internet. We ask all these things in that precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. Pee Wee Barry is watching. Hello, Pee Wee. How are you, darling? We're glad to have you watching today. You know, it's so sad today that Christianity in our world at this hour has uh, degraded and become something so negative and so destructive that so many people today who are not part of the church will listen to Christian preachers and teachers on the radio and on television and brother they can only handle what they hear for so many minutes and they've got to turn the dial and, and turn something else on. 
because what they're hearing is so negative and so condemnatory and they just can't stand to listen. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'm a born again child of God and I don't watch Christian television. I'm a born again child of God and I don't listen to Christian radio. I can't stand the vomit that is being preached in the name of the Lord. I cannot stand the garbage that is being preached and that those who are preaching it are claiming it is a word from God. It is not a word from God. It is not a word from God. It is satanic. It is demonic. It is devilish in origin. It is pushing people away from the cross of Calvary and not pulling them closer to it. Amen. Jesus said that if he, he said, and if I, and I, if I be lifted up from the world will draw all men unto me. Let me tell you, if you lift up Jesus, if you preach this gospel the way it is meant to be preached, people will be drawn like flies to honey. Hallelujah. People will be drawn to the message because the message is the man. That's right. The message isn't queers are going to hell. The message isn't those who get abortions are going to hell. The message is not a word of condemnation. It is not guilt mongering. It is not a word of fear. It is a message of hope and healing and salvation that is all encapsulated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, to hear some people tell it, you'd think God took on the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could uh, bring condemnation to the world so that he could choose which human beings he was displeased with and which human beings he was unhappy with because after all, all he has on his mind is judgment and condemnation and destruction. To hear some people tell it, God spends more time thinking about hell than we do thinking about heaven. To hear some people tell it. And yet, as Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, during the course of that conversation, he made it abundantly clear that the mission that he was on was a mission of mercy. Hallelujah. It was not a mission of guilt. It was not a mission of condemnation. It was not a mission of destruction. It was a mission of mercy. Hallelujah. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know, I could preach a whole sermon just on that one passage of Scripture. That one verse I just read to you has got some wonderful nuggets of truth in it. We talked last Sunday about the fact that he who knew no sin became sin. Isn't that what the Word of God told us? He who knew no sin became sin so that he could condemn not the sinner, but condemn sin. Hallelujah! He rendered sin powerless. See, what separates the believer and the unbeliever is not whether or not there's sin in their life. Listen carefully now. But whether or not that sin ultimately will have any power in their life. Oh, there's sin in their life, all right. You see, you take a man who's been bitten by a rattlesnake, and you stand him next to a man who's been bitten by a rattlesnake, but who had the cure injected into his veins, the antivenom. Well, I got news for you. The guy who's been bitten by the rattlesnake, that, that venom's going to have power over him. It's going to kill him. Hello now. But the guy who's had the anti-venom added to his bloodstream, he's going to live. Why? Because the rattlesnake poison has been rendered powerless. Hello now. By the anti-venom. Does he still have rattlesnake venom in his body? Sure he does. 
but it's now rendered powerless to you. And I'm telling you today, you see, that's what Jesus did for us. He added the antivenom. Hallelujah. He injected us with a little bit of his blood. He who knew no sin became sin so that he might condemn sin in the flesh. He said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You remember the story of the Hebrew children, the people of God passing through the desert on their way to the promised land? And all of a sudden, judgment came upon them and snakes were unleashed in their midst. And if you're anything like me, the whole thought of that doesn't go over very well. <laughs> the idea all these little serpents run loose, you know. I'm with Bill. I hate spiders. <laughs> I don't like spiders. I'm with you, Bill. Believe me. I'm up there at that campground all the time with chemicals all over. You know, I look like the Ghostbusters with this big old thing strapped in my back. And, you know, I'm spraying everything because I hate spiders with a passion. Well, I only think I hate worse than spiders probably a snakes and here the people of Israel were being bitten by serpents and it was killing them and God told Moses take you a serpent and wrap it around a pole and then elevate that pole in the center of camp and anybody who's been bitten by a serpent that's dying all they have to do is look to the serpent and live hallelujah all they have to do is look toward that serpent and I'll heal them I'll deliver them I'll make the venom in their body so that it has no power over them Jesus said in the same way that the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness he said, I too must be lifted up. Because in the same way that looking to that serpent and living and rendering the poison in your body powerless, he said, in that same way, those who look to me on the cross and believe, hallelujah, will be delivered from the curse of sin. And sin will be rendered powerless in their lives. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ooh. He said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The apostle Paul said, I've determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, oh, I'm going to tell you, honey. I, you know, we got all these preachers running around and everybody wants to preach something deep. Everybody wants to preach something new that nobody has ever heard before. All these preachers want to be known. Oh, isn't he deep? Doesn't he always have a new revelation? Isn't he always uncovering another nugget from the Word of God? Honey, the most powerful, potent, a practical, necessary preacher we have in the world today is that little preacher in the little country church who has no education, who has little understanding of the Word of God, and who knows nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All he knows how to preach is the cross. All he knows how to preach is the crucifixion. All he knows how to preach is the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah! That is the most powerful preacher on the planet. That's right. Sometimes you get so much crap going around in your brain, you start preaching all kinds of thoughts of your own invention. I listen to preachers sometimes, and I can always tell you when they're preaching the Word of God and when they're preaching something that was invented in their own head. Hello now. Because the minute you start to veer away from the man Jesus Christ, the minute you start to veer away from the cross, the minute you start to veer away from the blood, then honey, guess what? You're going off in your own devices. You're going off in your own mind. You're no longer in the vein of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ will always be centered on for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever liveth perfectly. No, it's not what it says. Whosoever liveth sinlessly. That's not what it says. Nope. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, you ask any evangelical, you ask any fundamentalist, and they will tell you that John 3.16 is the heart of the gospel. Yep. Of course, the next words out of their mouth are going to go off in a completely different direction. They're going to tell you how God loved the world so much that he became a man and died for it. And then they're going to go off and tell you how you're going to hell. Because while you believe that, you just aren't up to snuff as a human being. That because while you believe that, you can believe that with all your mind and all your mind. You can believe that with everything that's in you. But you just don't live right enough to make heaven. Hello now. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Got news for you, honey. Jesus didn't come on any mission of condemnation. He did not come to condemn. He came to save. Why did he come? Because God loved the world. Amen. Listen, why did he come? John 3, 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came on a mission of mercy. And don't you ever lose sight of that. You ignorant preacher, get up and preach how God hates these and God hates those. Honey, you are so far off the mark you don't even know. Satan signs your paycheck, not King Jesus. Amen. Because your message no longer has at its heart John 3.16 and 3.17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever does what believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did he come on a mission of mercy? For God sent not his son into the world. You see how the Lord lined that up? You see how he spoke those truths? He put first why he did not come. He didn't put last why he did not come. He put first. He didn't say, I came to say not to condemn, which would have made the condemnation aspect an add-on, you might say. No, he made the saving part an add-on. He made it abundantly clear, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, comma, but that the world through him might be saved. He wanted to make the point perfectly clear for you and I today that he was not on a, on a, on a mission of condemnation, but rather a mission of mercy. He did not come so that the world could be condemned, but that the world through him might be saved. And then verse 18, who in the world can access this truth he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. What separates a saint from a sinner? High hair and long sleeves. What separates a saint from a sinner? Uh, living this lifestyle or that lifestyle. Going here, going there, not doing this, not doing that. No! What separates the sinner from the saint? They believe, hallelujah, for if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, you can believe Franklin Graham, LGBT person, all you want to and wind up splitting hell wide open because that lying false prophet convinces you that you're not good enough for heaven or you can believe the word of God. Hallelujah. I choose to believe the word of God. Yes. Right. I'm not fearful of judgment. I'm not fearful of death. I'm not fearful of standing before God in the judgment. Not because I have some holiness in my life that I can point to. Not because there's some perfection in my life that I can brag about. Not because of some action I took in this life that I can tell the Lord about. But because I believe the Word of God and I believe Jesus. 
came. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. Hallelujah. I believe the heart of the gospel. Glory to God. And I've accepted God's love. Amen. I said, Lord, you love me enough to go through all this for me and I receive it. Hallelujah. I believe it and I receive it. So many Christians present the gospel as a warning of judgment rather than as an announcement of love, God's love. But in the same passage where the love of God for a lost world is expressed, a clear and concise message of the Lord's not coming to judge and condemn is declared. And by none other than the Lord himself. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad we have from Jesus' own lips that he came to save and not to condemn? Amen. See, we have Paul writing, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have Paul writing, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We have Paul telling us that. But in our primary text today, we have Jesus, hallelujah, himself, Telling us, I haven't come to condemn. I've come to save. Hallelujah. And that purpose in my mission, the thing that motivates me on this mission of mercy is the love of God. Hallelujah. That's what motivates me. What put me on the cross was not the sinner's hatred, but the Savior's love. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. He told old Pilate, that I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. He could have called that process to a halt at any given moment. But what put the Savior on the cross was his love for lost humanity. It wasn't the hatred of the Romans. It wasn't the hatred of the Jews that put him on the cross because he could have called that whole thing off at any given second. No, it was his love. You know, I used to sing when my allergies weren't driving me so nuts that I can barely sing anymore. I used to sing a song that said, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You know, those hours he spent hanging on the cross prior to breathing the words, it is finished. I believe with all my heart that during that time, every single one of us passed through the Lord's thinking. I believe he looked forward through time and he closed his eyes on that cross with his arms outstretched in pain and agony and thought about the reason I'm here, Johnny and Bill and Tommy and Charles and Adam and Brandon and Marvin and Claude and all those others who are one day going to believe on me, who are going to trust me, who are going to put their confidence in my word, not in the word of some preacher who's twisted and perverted everything I ever said. Yes. My Lord, have mercy. In 1 Timothy 1.15, the word of God today reads, This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Jesus, excuse me, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul the Apostle said. Hallelujah. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy. In other words, this is something that everybody ought to be able to accept and embrace and believe. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Hallelujah. You say that to a lot of so-called Christians in the world today, and they'll say, yeah, but I'll tell you what, he's also a God of judgment. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Uh, Paul didn't say that. You said that. Paul didn't. You said that. Jesus didn't. Nowhere in John chapter 3, 14 through 18, is the judgment of God even brought forth except to say that those who do not believe in him are condemned already. Why? Because they have not believed in his name. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Luke chapter 9, verses 6, uh, 51 through 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. In other words, the Samaritan people suffered a lot of racism. They suffered a lot of prejudice because they were not full-blooded Jewish people. And these people were constantly being ridiculed by the Jews. They were constantly being mocked. They were constantly being talked about and spoken of and treated as though they were dogs. And when the Lord was trying to travel to Jerusalem, but he was passing through Samaritan territory, he sent some of his disciples to this little city and said, listen, we're on our way to Jerusalem, but we need accommodations for the night. And nobody wanted to help them. You know why? Because all they ever get out of Jerusalem is condemnation. All they ever get out of Jerusalem is judgment. All they ever get out of Jerusalem is negativity. They say, oh, y'all are headed to Jerusalem, huh? Well, if you're headed to, to Jerusalem, we don't want you to even stop in our city. We don't even want you to stop here. But like so many good Christians, the Lord's disciples come back to him. Listen. And when, the, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Lord, should we just call down condemnation and judgment from heaven on them because they have refused to accommodate you? Of course, don't even look at the reasons why. How many people in the church today want to condemn the gay community to hell? They want God to rain down judgment on the LGBT community. But of course they ignore the fact that all LGBT people ever get out of the church is negativity and judgment That's and right. condemnation. They ignore the fact that all LGBT people ever hear out of Christianity is a bunch of horrible negative stuff. Amen, that's right. right. But see, that's, that's how carnal minds work. That's how minds that are not under the tutelage and the influence of the Holy Ghost work. Because had their minds been under the leadership and the influence of the Holy Ghost, they would have thought different. How do I know this? Look at Jesus' response in verses 55 and 56 of Luke 9. But he, meaning Jesus, turned and rebuked them. You don't get any stronger language than rebuked. He rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. See, you do you don't realize what kind of devil you're operating under. You don't even realize what kind of a demonic power is motivating you to speak those words. There are people in the church today, folks, they don't even know the type of spirit they're under the influence of. And it is not God's spirit. And the Lord continues to say, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You see, that's the sickening part. Wasn't well, like there wasn't other places they could go to. Got news for you, my Christian friend who loves to pick at abortion clinics and loves to pick at gay pride parades. Uh, there are a lot of other places you could go, and people would be perfectly receptive to everything you got to say. Hello, now. There are a lot of other places you could go where you might be a whole lot more effective in reaching people for Jesus. 
Problem is, you're so hung up, you're so motivated by that demon that that spirit has you wanting to go places where you can push people further away from the cross rather than draw them nearer to it. Why? Because what you're not doing is lifting Jesus Christ up. He said, if I, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You're not lifting up Jesus. I promise you, you're not lifting up Jesus. If you were lifting up Jesus and not being effective, then that would make Jesus a liar. If you were lifting up Jesus at that gay pride parade and people aren't falling down on their knees repenting at the sound of your voice, if you were truly lifting up Jesus, then, uh, you're, then either you're right or the Word of God is right, or you're wrong or the Word of God is wrong. Which is it, I wonder? I dare say you're wrong. I dare say the Word of God is right. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth... I will draw all men unto me. If you were doing this thing right, then people would be drawn to the Lord. He said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. This fool, these foolish people running around claiming that it's a Christian thing and that our nation ought to kill LGBT people. What manner of spirit are you operating under? Because it is not the Spirit of God. It is not God that's motivating you to speak those words. Because Jesus came on a mission of mercy, am I telling the truth? He did not come on a mission of condemnation. He did not come on a mission of guilt. He did not come on a mission of destruction. He said, I have not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. Here's the most important phrase in this entire passage. In the very act. They didn't just hear about it. They saw her. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote, in the ground, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. I'm so glad that my God has selective hearing. Aren't you glad God has selective hearing? Hallelujah. When somebody comes to him and all they have for you and I are words of condemnation and words of accusation, the Lord sits there and just starts doodling in the sand. Hallelujah. He starts to create another canyon. He starts to pave the way for another river or another stream and ignores every word they have to say. I'm going to tell you something. God ain't interested in your condemnation. God isn't interested in your guilt mongering. God isn't interested in your negativity and your message of destruction. He don't even listen. I don't tune in to preachers on TV preach that garbage. I got news for you. God don't either. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he wrote on the crown as though he heard them not. Verse 7, John chapter 8. So when they continued asking him, because <coughs> religious folks will be persistent. You can bet on that. I've never met a person with a religious demon yet who won't push their point to the limit. Amen. Uh -huh. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience 
went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, excuse me, go and sin no more. Hallelujah. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. What Jesus said to her was, neither do I condemn thee, because that's not why I'm here. I have not come to enforce the law. I have not come to stand by the rules and the mandates and the edicts of the Hebrew law. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. We got Christians in the church today, fools, stupid Christians, who don't understand that we're not here to enforce the Old Testament law. That's not our job. We're not here to condemn and criticize. We're not here to judge. That's not our job. Our job today is to be agents of mercy because Jesus came to earth on a mission of mercy. Hallelujah. His mission was not one of condemnation. We saw that. We saw that when James and John came to him and said, Shall we call down fire from heaven? Like Elias did. Like Elijah did. Shall we call down fire from heaven? The Lord said, What? You know not what manner of spirit you are of. You don't even know what kind of spirit you're being influenced by that you would utter those words. Church, I'm going to tell you something. We better be careful because we're a lot today, the LGBT community especially, and not just LGBT people, but a lot of Christian people have been hurt and ostracized. They've been pushed aside. They've been made to feel like they're outsiders, that they're not quite good enough to fit into the church, you know. They're not quite good enough to make heaven. And they get so discouraged. And we become like, very much like the Samaritan people. We feel like, well, we're half Christian. And yet at the same time, we're half the world. Because we're not fully living for God. We're not going to the temple in Jerusalem to worship like the Jews do. We're not doing things the, fully the way the church says we ought to do it. Because when you get discouraged and despondent over the message coming out of the church, what happens? You tend to separate yourself and you start living differently than the church says you ought to live. I got news for you. I've been telling people now for over 25 years, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the... Christian church doing a lot of things wrong. A lot of preachers preaching the wrong message. But sweetie, don't confuse yourself. Don't think that means everything they're saying is wrong. Hello now. Don't throw out the baby. Don't, don't think that all of a sudden because they're screwing up in some of their message that you don't have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Don't start thinking that Jesus Christ was just a man. Don't start believing that it doesn't matter what way you enter into heaven, whether it be through Buddha, whether it be through Muhammad, whether it be through Krishna, whether it be through uh, this one or that one. It doesn't matter what faith you enter in through. They're all going to the same place anyway. Uh, no, 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 that's not what Jesus said. He said, he's condemned already. Who's condemned already? He that doth not believe, hath not believed on the name of the Son of God. Am I telling the truth today? No, there is still one name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that name is Jesus. You still need to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Don't kid yourself. Don't throw that message out just because some of their message is polluted. Some of their message is diluted. Some of their message is compromised. Some of their message is carnal and man-made. That may be true, but don't throw out the whole thing. Because even Satan came to Eve and Adam in the garden 
and he mixed truth with error. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Amen. The biggest cult in the world has some truth in it. Not enough to justify its existence, but they're not stupid enough to preach nothing but falsehood. Hello now. No, they're always going to mix a little bit of truth. Because when medicine don't taste good and you're likely to spit it out, what do they do, Johnny? They mix it with a little bit of applesauce. Or they mix it, you know, these cough syrups, they mix it with a little cherry flavoring. Or they'll mix it, you know, with a little lemon flavoring, right? Am I telling the truth? That's right. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, LGBT person. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The gospel is still true. Jesus still loved you enough to go to the cross for you. Amen. He still came from heaven on a mission of mercy. And you were the object of that mission. Don't you ever lose sight of that. Don't you ever lose sight of the fact Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why must you come to God our Father who is the Spirit through the person of the man Jesus Christ? It's simple because the man Jesus Christ is the very image of, I'm quoting scripture, is the very image of the invisible God. So you can't come to God without coming through Jesus because Jesus is the physical representation of God himself. So when you present yourself to Jesus on the cross of Calvary, you're presenting yourself to God. We talked about it last Sunday. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Hallelujah. When you kneel at the cross of Calvary, you're kneeling before the face of God. Hallelujah. You're accepting his gift. You're accepting his offering on your behalf. Oh, I've got good news today. Gospel means good news. I'm not up here preaching a negative message today. I'm up here preaching a very good word, a good positive word, because you can't preach the gospel without it being positive. You can't preach the gospel without it being good news, because the word gospel means good news. So if your message doesn't, it sounds like good news to straight folk, but it don't sound like good news to gay folk, I got news for you. You ain't preaching the gospel. That's right. Because it's not good news to some and bad news to others. That's right. It's good news to everybody who hears it. Am I telling the truth today? Hallelujah. So if I ask you today, what kind of mission did Jesus come on when he visited this little planet we call Earth? What would your answer be? Lord, by the mission of love. mercy. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God.